it's part of our landscape here in the U.S. now. You know, it's everywhere, whether it's in a hemp form or it's in a dispensary form. You know, people are experimenting and purchasing it. So when they come to us and say, hey, it didn't work, we're going to triage that as nurses do and say, okay, well, tell me what about it didn't work. You know, really try to, you know, dig a little deeper and get to, well, okay, here's why it may not have worked for you and how we can adjust that. So hoping to grab them back before they've given up completely on cannabis that's not going to work and giving them now new education to say, well, this is what you maybe want to try. Under advisory. Catherine Golden, founder and CEO at Leaf 411, is a firm believer in the medical and therapeutic benefits of cannabis. And as a registered nurse, she's seen firsthand what a difference the plants can make. However, the challenges surrounding consumption, dosing and even product affordability mean that many looking to try cannabis as a medicine struggle. Advice and education are critical steps towards wider adoption. But with so many people looking for help, the challenge is serving them all. Hello, and welcome to the Lobster Pot podcast. I'm Dave Barton, co-host and co-founder of Thermidor and of the Lobster Pot, ably assisted by Jamie Bonthron. How are you doing, Jamie? We're, I'm uh, very well, sir. You and I yeah. have been deep in thought on a number of occasions today. I feel charged. Yeah, it's, um, I'm in a good place. Charged with what, though, is the question. Charged with what, <laughs> Your Honour? That's a good question. That's a good question. That's it. And, you know, when it comes to cannabis, that, you know, particularly here in the UK, that, that could, uh, you know, have a variety of different meanings. But, uh, but today our guest is from the good old US of A over in Colorado. We have lady called Catherine Golden of Leaf 411. Welcome, Catherine. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, so tell us a little bit more just about yourself and what you're doing at Leaf 411. And yeah, and we'll talk, take it from there. So you predominantly, you're, you're a registered nurse. Is that right? Is that how you call it in the U US as well? Yes, correct. So I've been a registered nurse for about 27 years, and I've been in cannabis nursing for about six of those. Um, I got into cannabis nursing mainly like a lot of people do. There's a personal connection or story that leads you into it. Um, I was always against cannabis. I even voted against it when it was up for a vote here in Colorado for adult use. Um, and medical and I didn't I believed the propaganda you know as a medical professional I thought well you know gosh if if there was some research out there I'm sure we would be told about it um, so I it didn't work for me personally and I just believed um, I you know the stigma I, I was I fed into that so um, until about six years ago seven years ago my brother-in-law was suddenly diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and given uh three to five years to live and he was in his 40s two kids in high school and non-smoker had no idea where it came from um so you know everybody jumped jumped up and said let's let's tackle this and it was mentioned a couple of times um when they were seeing um, some, you know, uh, researchers that, well, we'll look into cannabis, but that's last ditch effort because we know nothing about it. So I said, well, gosh, it's so popular here in Colorado. This was in 2016. We had just um, started our adult use. I said, well, let me look into the validity of this. I went to all my um, regular science platforms and I said, I was actually angered by how much science there really was. And yet we weren't told as a medical community that there, even though it was most mostly animal and uh, lab models, but there was showing promise, promise of what this plant could do. And so that's when I thought, okay, that's it. I'm jumping into, you know, self-education because at the time there wasn't a, a, really a lot for medical professionals to even study. You had to do it on your own. And, um, and then that started my journey. Um, when I was in private practice as a cannabis nurse, even though I was in a very affluent area here in Colorado, People were uh, walking in saying they were ha having a hard time affording the appointments um, because it's all out of pocket, no insurance coverage for the medicine or the physician appointment. Um, so that's where the need for Leaf 411, my idea is like, well, I've got to be, you know, I want not just my brother in law and my sister to have ca uh, access to a cannabis nurse and, and go over these questions that's such new language to them. I want everyone to be able to access a licensed medical professional, regardless of what you can afford. So that's when I started Leaf 411, which was a cannabis nurse hotline. Um, and it's evolved since then. We have affordability programs, outreach programs, 
we take about anywhere from about, I guess, now on average 500 calls a month across the country in legal and non-legal states of people asking about hemp and dispensary products. That's my background. <laughs> Whoa. No, no, thank you for sharing. I mean, again, what what a kind of series of kind of stories there. I mean, it's it, it's incredible. I mean, so so prior to, to sort of twenty sixteen, you hadn't really considered cannabis as a as a as medicine. It, because again, and that's in, this is something we hear in the UK a lot, you know, doctors just don't know about it. It's not how they've been educated, it's not been part of the curriculum until they actively go seeking something like so again that that sort of story itself feels you know it's it, you know very familiar to what, what a lot of uh, medical professionals looking at over here which is quite interesting but what what yeah sorry what has kind of been your uh, you, again trying to, trying to understand it you you just kind of fell into the research and you felt like there wasn't any before and now it's like wow it's actually all here and there's actually people and and again what was that kind of that sort of tipping point was it just that there's so much information that you could actually see. You were learning about the positive impact it's having on people's lives. Right. Yeah. I mean, as clinicians, we we rely on evidence based information. We don't just say, oh, here's a new uh, miracle product. Everyone try it. You know, we want to see the black and white. Well, show me some proof. Show me some data. Um, and, you know, we take our patients lives in our hands and we want to make sure that if we're advocating for something, there's some evidence behind it. So to me, seeing that on our um, uh, science platforms that there was more uh, peer-reviewed articles on different cannabinoids, different parts of the plant than there was in acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, ibuprofen, um, Advil, you know, more science on that, even though it was animal and, and lab model, there it was just shocking. And then once you stepped into it, which I didn't know is that our own government had uh, put a patent on CBD and THC because they knew it was um, it was uh, um, uh, gosh neuroprotective. So you knew they knew that there were certain properties of this of this plant um, that was beneficial. So when you're starting to read that, we're like, wait, our government knew this, but yet that was years ago, and we don't know this. How is this possible when you have so many people suffering and turning to? Uh, opioids and having this addiction problem and you know and here's a plant that you know there's no lethal dose why aren't we why isn't that first line why is that last line so you start questioning all of this and that's where it came and I said oh there's something here you know whether it's hidden the propaganda you have to you have to swim through all of that and fight through all of that to find the truth that's it it's a real it's a it's a minefield especially you know as someone who's educated and who's who who actually understands it and can absorb it you you know you said it there it's it's a difficult journey and that probably segues nicely into the fact that it's a real challenge for people who are just coming to cannabis as a medicine as people as patients uh, i'm really interested to hear um perhaps it's obvious to some people i'd, I'd be kind of what, what are the things that the patients that contact you are really wanting to know what are the what are the kind of common questions what are the burning questions what are the concerns that the patients who are new to cannabis are, are having yeah i think you know we actually collect all that data and what was shocking to me and really broke my heart was that our whole our entire country is in pain whether it's physical pain, it's mental pain, there's some type of pain element that they're trying to deal with and they just want something that doesn't either sedate them, um, but gives them a quality of life that they can still have energy, but subside some of that pain so that they can tolerate it. Um, so that's usually one, that's always number one is pain. Uh, mental health pain actually took a large uh, segment of the calls when COVID hit. You know, a lot of people were um, high anxiety and what they were hearing was CBD could be good for anxiety. So the questions were, can I try it? You know, um, should I try it? You know, what about a lot of drug to drug interactions? You know, I, oh, I'm on all these pharmaceuticals. That, you know, is it safe to take? Um, things like that. How do I know which brands are safe? How do I know where to go? You know, I, and, and now it's, it's gosh, it, the evolution of the calls have been phenomenal. Right now we're getting into, I can't afford my medicine. What do I do? 
how do I afford it? You know, I can't afford, I'm, I'm using it on my own because I can't afford the doctor's appointment, but how do I know what to pick when I can go into adult use store? It's like over the counter use, right? Hmm. So all this variety of wonderful stuff and they don't know what to grab. They get some counseling from what we call here in the States, bud tenders, you know, um, a lot of the States call them bud tenders or, you know, cannabis care team. Um, but those are just your kind of retail uh, counter sales people. Yeah, and not to kind of do them a disservice because obviously mm-hmm. you, they're very passionate advocates for for cannabis. But again, is it should it be their place to kind of be advising on healthcare issues? I mean, anecdotally right. even. I mean, that requires specialist knowledge and training, and you know, as mm-hmm. as you as you have un- undergone. You know. Yeah. And that's what I advocate for, you know, is taking yeah. that stress off their shoulders. You know, you've got, you know, uh, you know, young adults in their 20s that are that are getting these, you know, kind of entry jobs. And then they're being told, well, you know, when they come in and ask about what's what do I use for cancer, you have to answer them. And they're like, I, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to help offset that load of responsibility off their shoulders there's a high turnover now as far as employment too so you can go in a dispensary and you can see you may see one person one time and then it's they're gone you know and they're off to another job so so i think all of that is that kind of uh broken system that well how do we fix that and that's having the public know well there's cannabis educated clinicians that you can um that are attainable that you can reach out to yeah, it's it's it's, uh, it's an interesting quandary, really. I mean, we, we talk about the difference between a rec market and a med market and, and who they support and who they're looking out for. And it's, you know, without even getting into the debate of something like private health care, it's, uh, it's interesting that that responsibility would be thrust on someone whose job is to make a sale. And that immediately puts you in a very different perspective to a person that maybe is looking to give care. And that isn't speaking to bud tenders, because I'm sure the vast majority, if not all of them, have good intentions. But it's it's whether or not they have the ability to back that intention up and whether or not that's going to override the need for them to complete their own, you know, their own job, the thing they're being paid for. So it's it's a it's a real I suppose a bit of a tug of war for them as well, as well as a kind of burden. It's a a real challenge in in that perspective. Are you seeing, you know, working with patients and speaking to patients who are interested in finding out more and wanting to become, have a more kind of advanced knowledge of how they take care of themselves. Are you seeing that being mirrored elsewhere in the medical profession? Are you seeing there be an interest from doctors or other clinicians in cannabis? Uh, absolutely. I mean, the the desire to learn this is growing, um, and I fully support and I understand where, you know, longtime clinicians are coming from saying, well, I've got my specialty. My specialty is pulmonology, and now i got to learn about cannabis, you know. So what we want to say is, well, cannabis is a, is a specialty on its own. So how about you outsource that to us? Just like you would say, hey, you've got a liver problem, you need to go to, you know, a uh, nephrol, uh, neph- sorry, <laughs> nephrologist, and you need to look into a specialty, someone who knows that area really well, or pulmonologist or ca- cardiologist, depending on which organ is affecting you. Well, same with cannabis. If you want to um, talk about cannabis, you know, that's a whole nother bodily system we just learned about that now they think, oh gosh, I have to learn about this and I don't really want to. Well, great. You don't want to. We are the experts in it. We've studied it. That's our specialty. And now outsource that to us. Mm-hmm. We'll educate your patient and return them back to you. It's it's interesting as, as a nonprofit, you know, you're looking to help empower patients and you're help, uh, looking to help care for patients. And that, that's a real, I suppose, a very helpful kind of way of operating in so much as you don't have to contend with the idea of it being a commercial enterprise. You know, it's just about delivering the help that you can to the people that you can. Um, right. And obviously trying to grow that over time and, and make it more impactful. But yeah, it's, it's a it, it's a really great way of doing it. Now, we spoke to you before and you mentioned some of the work that you've been doing and, and the help that you get from other companies, either in terms of what you can deliver. Can you, can you expand a bit on that and, and what you've been able to help with physically beyond just the kind of support via, via phones? Yeah, so the other um, the other services that we focus on right now is affordability. So we work with uh, brands that will donate product that's either soon to be expired or, you know, there's so many uh, heavily regulated. So there could be one new um, item they have to put on their label. 
and then they have to take off all the existing product that had the old label off their shelves and they could no longer sell it. So instead of destroying it, and there's a cost in destroying it, um, we ask them to donate it to us. We turn around and give it to, you know, we get it into the um, people, into the hands of people in need. So that's one thing that we've worked with our dispensary partners here and our manufacturers. So that's another way that, um, you know, we're trying to help uh, this growing public who is now hearing our chants of cannabis is medicine, cannabis is medicine. They're like, okay, I want to try it now, but wait, I can't afford it. So how am I going to afford it? So that's where we're like, okay, we've got to figure out a way to do that as well. And look, look, just to understand, in terms of the sort of cost of, you know, I guess, doctor prescribed cannabis versus, you know, dispensary cannabis. I mean, what, I mean, and even with kind of, um, I guess, over the counter medicines, you know, like, you know, like you mentioned sort of Tylenol and things like that. What, what, what kind of prices are we talking about when you say it's, it, people can't afford it? What, what, how, how expensive is it? And I know the US is very much very different to the UK in terms of most people have some sort of you know commer you know it's, it's paid for healthcare isn't it i mean we have prescriptions and so forth and there's nominal fees but how, how does that aspect of it shake out what are those sort of costs that people are struggling with yeah so you know a typical copay for uh pharmaceutical here in the u.s is about ten dollars you know and mm -hmm. you can get your prescriptions that last 30 60 90 days you know maybe 25 dollars okay. maximum because sort of you're getting a couple yeah that's that might average. be just like something from Walgreens or whatever, or right. You know, yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Right. Similar, yeah. So your yeah. your anti anxiety medication or your pain medication, but hmm. then you go to cannabis and you want to replace that. You're looking at maybe a two week bottle of gummies that you mm -hmm. need to take, being about thirty dollars. You're like, okay. ooh, okay, that's that's <laughs> two weeks worth, and that's talking about someone that has a you know. Um, maybe a symptom that can be treated with a kind of over-the-counter dose. When you look into treating the disease, and that's like, okay, I want to treat the can cancer as the disease, which create, you know, I want to create apoptosis, cancer cell death. Well, you need hundreds of milligrams, you know, and you're, you're taking 100, 200 milligrams of CBD a day. You're going up to 30, 40, 50 milligrams of THC a day. Now, you know, we were looking at um, somebody that's using uh, uh, cannabis for cancer and they're spending about a couple hundred a week, you know, on that. So such a difference in cost that it, it's, it becomes unaffordable. So then mm -hmm. they're trying to figure out, well, how can I afford this medicine? And that's where we have that disconnect. Mm -hmm. No, no, thank you. It's interesting. I mean, again, the experience we have here in the UK of medical cannabis is, as, as you probably well know, um, people aren't used to paying for healthcare. So most people are on NHS, you know, we hit the free, you know, you pay the, like I say, that nominal fee. And so the idea of doing a kind of consultation with a, with a clinic and it will happen online, you'll do a call like this and it will be, okay, that's going to cost 50 pounds for just them to say, okay, great, meet the criteria. What can we get you? And what's always struck me odd about that, having been through that process is, you know, what the way in which the prescription is with using things like strain names i mean perhaps not everybody does that but again when you think about again maybe th when we talk about disconnects is that if you're talking about something like you know i don't know wedding cake as a form of medicine for you know anti-anxiety or something like that how how what's your sort of take on that i mean are people using sort of strain names when we're talking about it from a professional medical perspective i mean because it feels very strange right right well we you know strain names came out and were very popular about 10 years ago we didn't know how to get away from that um you know so we started you know there more and more research came out well with, really with the cultivars which strains um same same thing is the terpenes that are inside right so the terpenes are causing that uh that reaction that either the the scent or the taste and on top of it and so i what we focused on is teaching the public about terpenes, you know, so that way they didn't have to pay attention to the exact name because as it's cultivated in different states, it's changing, right? Depends on the environment that they're, the soil, everything that they're, they're growing that same um, clone of that same seed, you know, has changed. 
So what the, you know, the Durban poison in California is not Durban, the same exact Durban poison in Colorado. It's changed a little bit. So we, we found that out early on years ago. So now it's like, no, we've got to teach people about terpenes and what is, um, what, when they smell it, when they, you know, taste it, if they inhale, what is it about that, that, you know, feeds their system right, you know, or what, what, um, emotional response we're looking for. Are we looking for something sedative? Are we looking for something alerting? And so it, it, it's more education, but this way they're not locked into that, you know, certain cake flavor and I've got to find that everywhere. You know, they, they, we get them, we've gotten them away from that. So it's not, so it's really about, again, when you talk about that education, it's about getting people to understand them. And, and it's good for them to be very knowledgeable about the medication they're taking. I think that's, that's very important. Actually, that was something that when we were speaking to, uh, uh, Ellie and, uh, and and Sophie from Nurture Nursing here in the UK. I mean, I sort of say, you know, we're talking about, I think with Sophie's sort of role as a kind of, you know, clinic clinic nurse and things like that. And talking, I'm, I think I asked the question, you know, do people come in and they say, I want this strain, can you get it for me? This is what I need to kind of get through, you know, manage my condition or pain or whatever it is. And, you know, how do you deal with very well-educated or well-informed uh, you know, patients, and I guess it's slightly different in terms of what you're doing, but again, it can only be beneficial for people to have an understanding of what works yeah. for them. Yeah, I think if they would walk in and, or call or walk into a clinic and say, yeah, I, I need that Durban poison, you know, we'd say, well, let's take a look at what's in Durban poison that you that resonates with mm -hmm. your body. You know, if I can teach you that, then you can look at other strains and you start teaching them the different potencies, the ratios of the cannabinoids that are in that strain. So it, it's taking that saying, you know, the same thing instead of saying, well, I, you know, I like this certain recipe. Well, let's see the ingredients in that recipe. And that's now what you find. Now you find those ingredients and you can make your own copy of that. Very cool. Very cool. No, it's, you know, no, it's 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 um it's an interesting way to look at it, and I guess the fact that is sort of natural, naturally occurring medicine is a way to sort of say, it, like you say, it's putting together a recipe, finding something that you know, not just the um the actual medication, but I guess the the form of you know how you take it. I mean, do you have sort of questions about that? I mean, we've heard all sorts of stories about people creating their own kind of tinctures and inhalations and all sorts and i mean what what's the your kind of experience in that i mean obviously things work differently for different people and and that's mm -hmm. that's a that's a good thing but i mean are people particularly informed i mean it seems like there's a lot of potential sort of trial and error people are trying this out well i tried to inhale it i tried to you know put it in my food i tried to do that what what's your kind of take on that and what's your sort of advice to people around experimenting with their medication in a way that helps them identify the kind of treatment that works for them, I guess. Yeah, I think, you know, my hope is that we can, you know, we can offer this accessible education before mm. they start experimenting because mm. what I want to prevent is anyone getting discouraged too soon. Like, oh, I tried this and it didn't work. I mean, I hear that all the time. I tried this product, it didn't work, so I don't think cannabis is right for me. And then you find out well, it was the wrong route, it was the wrong, you know, cannabinoid profile for what they were looking for. Um, so my hope is that we get to them before it. But, you know, obviously, you know, there's already people, it's, it's part of our landscape here in the U.S. now. You know, it's everywhere, whether it's in a hemp form or it's in a dispensary form, you know, people are experimenting and purchasing it. So when they come to us and say, hey, it didn't work, we're going to triage that as nurses do and say, OK, well, tell me what about it didn't work. You know, really try to, you know, dig a little deeper and get to, well, OK, here's why it may not have worked for you and how we can adjust that. So hoping to grab them back before they've given up completely on cannabis that's not going to work and giving them now new education to say well this is what you maybe want to try you know and experiment with because there's more evidence showing for what you're trying to treat this is the road you should go down so i think it's trying to get to them beforehand it would be ideal but if not if we can catch them before they've totally given up that's a win yeah absolutely i asked 
you know, it's the perfect role for nurses as well, isn't it? It's that real patient contact. It's that digging deeper with, you know, a, a clinical, uh, you know, a clinical lens ultimately, you know, and then having, doing, doing both sides of it, doing the medical part and the kind of the social part almost, the looking after and the real patient care bit. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, what are your sort of goals for 2023? What are you looking for this year? Um, well, it's to keep little Leaf 411 going. I mean, what you know, it's such a fun, we get a phenomenal response, but um, as far as the service, public service we provide, like you're saying, you know, we are a nonprofit, we rely heavily um, on the industry here, um, actually philanthropically giving to put to support public cannabis education. Um, what's been a real challenge is kind of that, well, you know, what's the return on investment for me as a business? And you're like, well, this is supporting public education. You know, hopefully that's what you can leverage is that, hey, community, I'm supporting making sure you have access to this. But, you know, they're financially struggling across the U.S. as well right now. So, you know, it, it's tough. So it becomes tough for us because usually when you're giving to a nonprofit and you're financially struggling, that's the first thing you cut. So I think for us, you know, it's really um, continuing that, you know, beating my drum of like, come on, industry, let's support these folks because the medical user to me has always been the evergreen pay customer. You know, once you use it for medicine, you're going to want to use it for life, you know, because it, it's part of your routine. Our our industry here in the U.S., as soon as adult use came, they shifted their focus on, oh, I just want to sell the highest potency. Everybody wants to party. Let's. That's who our customer is. That customer only lasts a few ye couple of years here and there. You know, they're in their your 20s, early 30s. It ends with that because now their families have started and their you know careers have started um but so they lost focus of the medical patient so that's you know that's what i want to um really hone in on with our industry is let's turn back to the medical patient because that is who your customer is and who is going to use for a long time and all the different varieties of cannabis that's out there so I want to grow Leaf 411. I, we've got some really big things on the horizon here in the, you know, in, in with different partnerships I talk to. Hopefully can get it covered by insurance someday soon. That's what we work on. Very cool. And where can people find out more about what you're doing and how can they get involved? Sure. Yeah, you can find us at leaf411.org. Um, you can find us on our website. We have information there. We're on Twitter. We're on um, Instagram. We're on Facebook, <laughs> LinkedIn. I mean, you All can find socials. us everywhere. <laughs> All the socials. Yes. Excellent. And I guess in terms of people kind of getting involved, what kind of support, I mean, other than kind of financial and products, what kind of things are you looking for right now? Yeah, um, the support we ask for, like you said, is all, obviously, you know, is the we want the industry to support us. So we ask any of our callers, um, you know, tell your local dispensary, tell your local brand, hey, you should support Leaf 411. I went to them, got information, and now I know what to buy. You know, it, it cuts down on buyer's remorse, number one. So they're going in and they're successfully buying a product. So that's the support that we ask for is just tell your um, your businesses that you frequent to support Leaf 411 because then we can be here and we can educate that consumer to buy smart, you know, and to and and not regret what they purchase. So that is one of our main hopes. Other than, of course, like you said, funding and we reach out to foundations and you know, um, so all of that is is ideal. Very good. Well, very best of luck with it, and thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, we look forward to speaking to you again. Yes, me too. Thank you.